All right, so let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody. This is the last seminar for USF Transition Seminar Series for the fall 2022. And the seminar series is sponsored by the Department of Civil and Environment, Environmental Engineering and also Center for Urban Transition Research. It is also co-sponsored by uh, three UTCs. Um, one is the NISA National Institute of Congestion Reduction, which is led by USF. Another one is the TomNet, uh, plays a uh, new text to the old model. And also another one is uh, Center for Transition Environment and Community Health, CTEC, led by them. And this seminar is also uh, facilitated by our student chapter, ITE student chapter. So um, today we're very glad to have uh, Professor Gaosha Aka with us. And she's the chair of the School of City and Regional Planning at uh, Georgia Tech. And um, Professor Aka conducts research on the sustainable urban mobility. And her work mostly focused on using you know, the data collection and the data and analytic, uh, analysis tools to measure the access and equity demographic differences in travel outcomes and adoption of new mobility uh, technologies. And uh, her research received you know, support from uh, different uh, funding agencies and sponsors. And uh, she has co-authored over 35 peer review articles in top tier journals. And um, Professor Arka actually joined Georgia Tech pretty recently. And before that, she was a professor of city and regional planning at the Ohio State University. Um, so with the further ado, I will give the control to Professor Arka. So um, please go ahead and start the presentation. And thank you for being here. OK. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the great introduction uh, and thanks for inviting me. It's an honor to be with you, although it's virtually uh, today during your uh, transportation Friday transportation seminar series. Um, I wish I could be there in person, but in retrospect, uh, maybe I wouldn't be there even if you had planned it <laughs> earlier because I'm feeling a little sick. So I'm hoping that I won't be coughing and sneezing in the middle of the uh, presentation. So um, today I'm going to talk about one of our recent publications on pandemic resilient cities, designing uh, pandemic resilient cities, where we looked at uh, the effects of COVID-19 on transportation outcomes. But uh, before I do so, I'm going to uh, give a little introduction about me, although uh, you already uh, mentioned a few things about me. I am now uh, at Georgia Tech. I'm, the, I'm a professor and I'm also the chair of the School of City and Regional Planning. And before that, I was at uh, the Ohio State University. I went through all ranks at the Ohio State University. And uh, prior to that, I received my doctoral degree from University of Maryland at College Park uh, in civil engineering. Um, I um, I truly enjoy Atlanta. I, I really like Georgia Tech and I'm hoping that you'll be able to visit us sometime in the near future. So um, my research focus is on sustainable mobility. And uh, just to give an um, introduction to this pre presentation and why we are interested in mobility, mobility is how we organize our communities. It is deeply fundamental to sustainable and resilient communities. Mobility cross-cuts all three sustainability dimensions, environmental, social, and economic uh, sustainability, and transportation is the critical infrastructure. Its ability, it gives us the ability to recover gracefully from shocks, failures, extreme weather, what we have experienced with COVID-19, and it's essential to design resilient communities. And a large number of scholars from different disciplines, as you already know, are working in the mobility place space, from planning to engineering to geography to behavioral sciences. Um, so in my research, I try to find um, answers to some of the everyday questions that we pose, such as why do bicyclists take detours? Why do some people take transit and some people are attached to their cars? What are the links between our planning and infrastructure decisions and travel outcomes? And how do these travel outcomes affect public health? 
Um, who are the users of micromobility modes? As we all know, micromobility modes and their users, there are disparities in terms of the users, race, gender and income levels. So I try to understand why do we have these disparities? And overall, I think in a nutshell, I'm trying to find ways to have sustainable mobility, going from the picture on the left to the picture on the right, where we have more people walking, biking, taking transit, and all these modes uh, coexisting together. Um, in the transportation planning and the urban planning fields, I see a number of themes that are emerging in the field. The first one is the urban revolution, that the world's urban population is increasing. More than half of the world's population is now living in cities, and this trend is accelerating. Crowding in cities will lead to resource scarcities and possibly more social inequalities. With this, if we are to survive and thrive in an urbanized world, we need to determine how we shape cities that are sustainable and sustainable in all three dimensions. Um, the cities that are economically viable, environmentally sound, and socially just. At the same time, we're going through transformations in our cities uh, through revolutions in data and technologies. Smart, connected infrastructure and data-driven technologies, they do have the potential to improve the lives of the residents, but they also have the potential to increase social divide, segregation and inequities to, in access to opportunities. Okay, uh, slide is not, okay, great, it's changing now. Um, so in order to address these challenges, uh, we need to leverage urban revolution together with data and technologies to design diverse, equitable and inclusive cities that can gracefully recover from shocks and disruptions. We need to understand that cities are complex systems and our decisions will have intended and unintended consequences. And uh, to design diverse, equitable and inclusive cities, mobility is the key puzzle piece that touches almost all aspects of cities, from environment to economic development, to social equity, to health, uh, and through technology and infrastructure. So today's talk is going to uh, focus on um, one of our recent research papers that are that is published, which is on COVID disruptions, uh, travel outcomes, and how we should design resilient uh, cities. COVID-19 brought about disruptions to everyone's life. Uh, it disrupted the economic activities through changes in employment, commutes, um, other out-of-home activities. Uh, we adopted to remote working, online shopping and social distancing. Uh, we sought solutions through information and communication technologies mostly. And since the pandemic, researchers worldwide conducted studies on the effects of COVID-19 restrictions on daily mobility. I was at a conference a few weeks ago and one of the presenters uh, mentioned that since the start of the pandemic, there were over a hundred publications in peer-reviewed journals only on the effects of COVID-19 and bicycling outcomes. So thinking about how much we published, how much we presented on COVID-19 and travel outcomes, I think it's outstanding what we managed to do within the within two years. Um, so we know that the effects of pandemic are not evenly distributed due to disparities across different neighborhoods. And we also know that the infection risk or the perceived infection risk really affected our out of home activity participation. So with this, um, we uh, came up with, we decided to seek answers to research questions on COVID-19 and co travel outcomes. And we specifically focused on the effects of built environment on COVID-19 infection risk perception while traveling and the effects of built environment on subjective well-being during the pandemic. And uh, while we were setting up our research scheme, we focused on the hard and the soft factors that affect travel outcomes. So the hard factors would be the built environment and social demographics, which would be somewhat easy to measure. And then the soft factors would include individual perceptions, attitudes, and subjective well-being assessments. Um, we collected data from the Columbus metro area in Ohio. Columbus metro area has a sprawled urban form, 
it has a well-connected highway system and a relatively sparse transit network. It's a major Midwestern city that is, as expected, more car dependent than coastal cities such as New York, San Francisco and Boston. And uh, these findings may be applicable to cities of similar size, similar urban form and transportation networks. Uh, transport sorry, uh, Columbus is also the 32nd uh, most populous metro area in the United States. Um, we collected surveys through uh, online surveys through Qualtrics and also through mailer surveys. And we asked questions regarding infection risk perceptions, overall travel satisfaction, subjective well being, um, personal and household characteristics. And we collected four waves of data. Uh, three of them were online data collection through Qualtrics, and one was a mailer survey. And uh, we collected data on an ongoing basis, starting with the stay home orders at the end of April through uh, February 2021. So at this stage, before I go into the analysis, I would like to show you a few data points from the very first uh, survey that we, uh, very first data wave that we collected uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic when the stay home orders were in effect. And um, and I would like to also mention that some of these um, answers changed uh, drastically as we move forward in time, um, start as compared to the very first wave. So during the very first wave, we asked individuals how did they travel uh, change after the stay home orders, and as expected, uh, we see significant decreases in uh, travel for both work and non-work purposes. Uh, those who reduced at least one type of trip, work or non-work, consists of 90% of the whole sample. And uh, the number of respondents who reduced their non-work trips is significantly higher than those who reduced their work trips. Um, and as you can imagine, this is again expected because some of the non-work trips are more discretionary in their nature. Then we asked the individuals about what aspect of their experience with their tri primary travel mode would they would they be missing during the stay at home orders and we disaggregated the respondents by their by their primary mode um, so all individuals auto users and non auto users they reported feeling independent is the aspect they missed the most um, however non auto users also responded uh, that they miss getting physical exercise in, and interacting with others as the remaining aspects, the top aspects of what they miss. And another important finding that we uh, would like, I would like to report here is that while 12% of auto users didn't miss any aspect of their pre previous travel experience, this number is 0% for non-auto users. So it's basically here. Um, I don't know, uh, my mouse is not moving, but uh, if you look at the uh, very last um, row, I do not miss any aspect at all. That's only that only exists for auto users. So uh, this shows that travel has an intrinsic value for all non auto users, while 12% um, of the auto users do not attribute any value to their auto trips. Um, looking at um, what people uh, think they would do after the stay home order restrictions are lifted, we ask whether they would reduce their travel time, continue reducing their travel um, after the stay at home orders are restrict uh, restrictions are lifted. We would say that more than 65% of the respondents stated that they are willing to reduce their travel for out of home activities, while only 15% wanted to go back to their previous activity and travel patterns after the stay home order restrictions are lifted. So, of course, I would say these percentages change significantly as we move along with the pandemic. And looking at the traffic uh, patterns now in Atlanta, I think almost everyone is back to their, uh, you know, commute um, travel patterns that we, that they were uh, conducting before the pandemic. So this slide shows um, individuals and their perceived uh, risk of getting infected on different travel modes. And as expected, um, based on the respondents, their perception is they would they would be more likely to become infected with COVID-19 if they were using shared modes 
such as bus, Uber, Lyft, taxi, car share, or other uh, micromobility modes, shared micromobility modes. On the other hand, individual travel options, namely uh, cars, bicycles, motorcycles, individuals uh, rated them as safest travel modes. So again, uh, these perceptions also changed somewhat as we move through the pandemic with masking and vaccinations and so on. So people started finding uh, transit and so more tolerable in terms of risk perception. But this was where we were at the very first time the travel uh, stay home orders were in place. So at this point, I'm going to go back to the overall data and the research questions that we had posed at the very beginning of this presentation. As I mentioned before, we had four waves of surveys, which resulted in about 1900 responses. And uh, we removed those individuals who did not provide uh, usable data for us, those who did not provide address information or those who skipped some of the key questions that we were focusing on, and that gave us about uh, 1,100 final observations. Um, the Qualtrics panel, so the online surveys were collected through Qualtrics, and the Qualtrics panel is an online sample recruitment service through Qualtrics. Uh, they provide a sample based on criteria defined by the research team and there is no response rate for it. So they basically call, continue collecting the data until they hit the number that you have requested. And we collected the mailer data through Dynata. Um, out of 3,400 responses, respondents, about 600 respondents uh, responded to our survey, which gave us about a 20% return response rate, which is somewhat expected with these uh, mailer surveys. Um, so in addition to the survey responses that uh, we had, so the survey responses gave us information about individual attitudes, perceptions, social demographic characteristics, and so on. But as we know, uh, transportation outcomes are really shaped by uh, built environment as well. So we brought built environment to our analysis using the EPA smart location database. Um, so in our surveys, we asked individuals um, about their address information, which in, with, with that we were able to geocode their locations. And with that, we were able to bring the built environment variables through the EPA smart location database. Um, looking at the descriptive statistics, and we did some comparisons um, as compared to the Columbus metro area, the sample had uh, somewhat more females included. Um, in terms of the race and gender, in terms of the race distribution, uh, whites are um, oversampled. And then um, the sample is skewed more towards the high, higher education uh, side of uh, the educational attainment. But we do control for these in the analysis, so we don't really foresee uh, significant problems with these. To answer the research questions that we post, we use structural equations modeling. Um, structural equation modeling has quite a few advantages. It allows the use of latent constructs, and this is significantly important, especially when we have a lot of variables that are uh, correlated with one another. We would like to reduce the dimensionality of the data, and many observable variables can be aggregated in a model to represent an underlying concept, making it easier to understand the data. Uh, with structural equations modeling, we are also able to calculate direct and indirect effects. For instance, in this figure, bicycling infrastructure affects the uh, bicycling perceptions of individuals directly, but also bicycling infrastructure may increase bicycling frequency for everyone. Um, and that could have an indirect effect on the pro-bicycling perception. So with structural equations modeling, we're able to disaggregate direct and indirect effects and measure them separately. And also we are, enabled, we are uh, able to cluster the responses. Um, we conducted confirmatory factor analysis to create latent variables and reduce the dimensionality of the data. This, um, this slide shows how indicators are related to the factors or latent variables. So as you can see, we have quite a few indicator variables where the respondents really 
responded to these questions, but we cannot really include all of them in our models because quite a few of them are correlated and uh, including all of these will also increase the dimensionality of the problem. So we created factors that associate uh, that uh, create the latent uh, factors that are based on these um, indicators. So for instance, we have an indicator, we have a latent variable for subjective well-being, which is based on the questions, which is based on the rank ratings of the individuals on questions such as I'm satisfied with my life. Uh, so far, I've gotten the important things I want in life. So um, questions, indicators such as these will feed into the latent construct, which is subjective well-being. And in a similar way, uh, we created latent variables for overall satisfaction, pro-environmental attitudes, and risk perceptions. So um, at the end, well, after we created these um, after, through the com um, confirmatory factor analysis and including the other variables, we were able to um, bring these variables together and estimate the models to understand the answers to our very first questions. So in this figure, um, all effects are standardized and significant at the 5% level. Uh, rectangles uh, here at the, very, at the right top, we have COVID, perce perceived COVID uh, infection risk, uh, perceived COVID-19 infection risk while driving. So these are um, observed variables. The ovals represent the latent variables, the ones that I just talked about. And the gray ones, the gray ovals, are the variables of main interest of the study. Um, green arrows are positive associations, and the red arrows represent negative associations. And uh, if an arrow is a dash, has a dashed line, it means an indirect effect. So um, after this introduction to this figure, I would like to pick a few of these variables and talk about what they mean in terms of subjective well-being, perceived COVID-19 infection risk, and also built environment factors. So um, we see that there's a negative association between compact, walkable, and accessible built environments and the perceived COVID-19 infection risk. And this finding demonstrates the potential of built environment improvements in promoting walking, biking, and scootering, scootering at this critical time under the pandemic. So compact, walkable, and accessible built environments decreases the perceived COVID-19 infection risk while using sustainable modes of transportation. Looking at the negative association between perceived Looking at the negative association between the COVID-19, perceived COVID-19 infection risk and subjective well-being, I think the negative association is, is expected because um, if the individuals um, have a higher infection risk perception, they are more likely to experience health anxiety or concerns related to their daily physical activities and thus they report lower subjective well-being scores. Um, we see that uh, looking at the dashed green uh, line from compact walkable environments to subject to well-being, and it's a positive association, we can argue that uh, built environment improvements can contribute to physical health by reducing perceived risk regarding physical travel and mental health by improving the subjective well-being, improving the potential to participate in out-of-home activities of individuals during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we see that there is a negative association between um, socioeconomic status and perceived COVID-19 infection risk. And uh, with this, we argue that those with lower socioeconomic status are more likely to lack health insurance and they have limited access to health care. And studies show that COVID-19 pandemic mainly ravaged the jobs and service industries and those with lower socioeconomic studies status faced layoffs. And since in the US uh, insurance system, health insurance is tied to employment, those with lower socioeconomic status may be more concerned about the negative effects of COVID-19 exposure. Um, we see that there is a positive association between age and subjective well-being, which we think this was not expected. 
Uh, COVID-19 studies actually show that contracting the disease causes a greater risk of severe illness for older adults. And um, due to the, the greater coronavirus virus concern, older adults reduce their physical activities and so social interactions more than the other groups. So with this, we were not really expecting this result. And uh, with further studies, we would like to look into why age ended up having a positive association with subjective well-being. So, um, so what these all mean in terms of the research questions that we posed at the very beginning really lies between the association between the um, compact walkable environments, perceived COVID-19 infection risk, and subjective well-being. So those will be the ovals, the gray ovals that we have been focusing on. And uh, with this study, we do have evidence that compact, walkable, and accessible neighborhoods, they reduce infection risk perception while using sustainable modes. And this is important because we would like people to continue being active, continue being able to access their out-of-home activities and also socialization. And uh, we also find that uh, compact, walkable, and accessible neighborhoods, they have an indirect effect to promote subjective well-being of individuals. So uh, with this, we argue that designing compact, accessible, and pedestrian and bicycle-friendly neighborhoods Hoods is crucial for our future city designs. Um, the compact, accessible, and pedestrian-friendly neighborhoods, they reduce the risk perception with, associated with sustainable modes of transportation. And individuals in these neighborhoods will exercise and interact with others and feel better. So uh, looking at sustainable urban design, we're talking about having mixed land uses so that there will be destinations which are going to be within walkable, bikeable distances. Uh, we would like to have environments that are connected, walkable, bikeable, and accessible. So of course, with any other research study, um, there, are, there are limitations to this study. So um, although we collected the data on an ongoing basis, uh, we don't really have before and after studies yet. So this is somewhat still in a cross-sectional nature. So um, this restricts what we can conclude from this study. So it's unknown to us um, looking at the temporary effects and longer term effects in the society. So I know that we are going back to some of our patterns that were before that we were experiencing before the pandemic, but nothing is really as before. And um, it will be interesting to uh, conduct similar studies looking into the future to see where the COVID pandemic and our behavior, changes in behavior will take us in the next few, uh, in the next decade or so. Um, one other uh, limitation, a significant limitation of the study is because we had limited number of responses from disadvantaged groups, transportation disadvantaged groups, such as older adults, racial minorities, it was difficult to make conclusions regarding these groups. So in the future, we may want to oversample these individuals to really understand um, their behavior and their travel outcomes as we move along um, into the future. Um, so this paper is recently published and it's available for download if anyone is interested. And if you want to link, I'll be able to, I can send you the link. Um, so this basically concludes my talk and I'll be very happy to entertain questions and have discussions uh, based on based on this work. Great, thank you very much, Gasha. Um, now we open the floor to audience uh, for asking questions. You can either put the question in the meeting chat or you can unmute yourself and speak out your question. So I'm, I'm not being able to see anyone or the chat, but is that normal or? Um... Uh... Should I stop sharing? Maybe that's the thing, right? Did you use a browser or you used the app? Um, I think I just clicked on the meeting link that you sent to me. Okay. So uh... it's okay. Um, yeah, sometimes um, you know depends on if you signed in with your own account, you may have you know restricted functions. 
um, okay. but um, I'm monitoring the meeting chat. So if there's okay. any questions, I will I will let you know. Maybe I can start with um, one question. Um, so you mentioned about this um, kind of the relationship between the age and the subjective well-being. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was wondering even without, you know, um, even not in the pandemic time period, because you mentioned you didn't uh, collect the data about those old adults. So your age range could be like in the middle somehow. And I feel like, you know, for um, for people in 40s, 50s, they probably be more mature and know knowing, you know, the hardest hardness of the life already, they kind mm -hmm. of more calm down and, you know, accept everything versus the younger people, they, they complain, they want change. So that's kind of something maybe pretty common, even like without considering other factors into that. So I was wondering for the literature in anthropology or in some other fields, has that been discovered already? Um, so uh, actually pertaining to COVID-19 and older adults, other studies report negative associations or negative um, you know, expectations when it comes to older adults. But you really pose an interesting aspect when it comes to older adults. And I understand, and your point is very well taken that they're more mature, they know what to do and they will not risk. So those are important uh, associations, I think. One other thing, although we were controlling for that in the um, in the sample that we had, um, so their um, social economic status, right? So as people age, they may also have higher incomes or health insurance associated. So with that, they may have, um, you know, they may feel more okay with, uh, you know, the idea of getting sick and ending up in the hospital because they have health insurance. So um, when I when we did this presentation at another um, you know institute, we were asked whether we controlled for the political affiliation of these individuals, and that is something we actually considered when we were uh, you know collecting the data. But the data uh, funding for this project came partially through the city, and they didn't want us to include any questions like that in the study. <laughs> so I think that could have been uh, an interesting factor to look at because. Columbus has a large young population, mainly centered through the Ohio State University, as well as some of the other employment centers. And I would, you know, I would be curious to see if there would be some differences in terms of political affiliation and age distribution. Yeah, that'd be very interesting because we have seen, you know, the pandemic, actually the, the policies towards the um, pandemic um, actually influenced by the politics a lot yes so, yeah <laughs> maybe later if if you know some survey could be done including that that'll be interesting to see how the outcomes will be yeah, yeah. exactly that will be a good control variable i think uh-huh okay so um there's another question from dr chin lu i think it's uh the question is about the implication and impact of oh no that was from last time. Sorry, <laughs> we have this series. So I, when I look, actually, I also see, I think that was from uh, the week before, before our <laughs> Thanksgiving. Sorry about that. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, any other questions from, uh, from the audience? Hi, hi Dr. Aka, this is Ching Wu, actually. Uh, <laughs> I have a question, uh, like, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm kind of curious about uh, the responses from the uh, uh, attendees of the surveys, uh, uh, um, because my personal feeling is that uh, we perceive the impact of the pandemic of, of the virus from mainly based on the information from the news media and the social media, um, the like the TVs and uh, and the social media, mm -hmm. and uh, um, like uh, from the from the people that are living around us, I, I I don't see significant impact from the pandemic. Like I don't see any people who actually die from the, due to the pandemic. So I'm kind of curious, my question is like, uh, in your study, did you consider the potential influence of the surroundings or the, of the, or, or the sources of the information and, and well, on the an, decisions? 
Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting question. And um, unfortunately, we did not include any information, any questions in terms of where individuals mainly look uh, up to getting their information. Um, we did have some questions and we were trying to really get around this question. We wanted to really include the, the, include the po political affiliation. Um, so we couldn't include that. So we were trying to get around it. And we had some questions related to you know, do you know anyone who has COVID? Name the top person, one person that has COVID. Where did you get mm. that information? A few questions like that, but we didn't get much responses to those questions, unfortunately. So um, a lot of respondents uh, skipped those questions. And in the end, we weren't really able to mm. include them in a meaningful way, um, you know, analyze them in a meaningful way. But yeah. that's um, that's that's true. So I think where you get your information or your social surroundings really affect how you uh, you know perceive or um, how you shape your attitudes. Right. I'm thinking that it might be very interesting if the similar study is is done here in Florida, <laughs> which have a kind of different political and uh, uh, democratic and uh, democratic features from Ohio. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it will be different in quite different cities, but I think the methodology could be applied. And I think yeah. as we move forward, we're thinking about what better variables, what better questions we could have um, included based on some of the restrictions that we have to work with. So yeah, I think those would be interesting to consider in the near future. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Chin Lu. And um, do we have any other questions from audience? Please feel free to jump in. <clears throat> uh, hi, hi, Gosa. Hey, how are hi. you? Hi, good. How are you? Um, thank you so much for uh, presenting uh, to uh, to our students. Um, so I had a couple questions. One was, um, I think I missed it, uh, but how did you measure subjective well-being? So um, we had a few questions in the survey um, that the individuals uh, rated uh, from a, you know, I strongly agree to uh, disagree, um, you know, based on a Likert scale. And we had, I believe, five or six uh, statements. I can go back to the presentation. Did I stop sharing or or no? I'm trying to understand. You're still um, sharing, I think, but you had uh, teams on top of your slides. Yeah. Oh, OK. So. Um, <clears throat> okay, you see my slides now? Slides with the notes or without the notes? Two slides, like, yeah, now it's good. Okay, great. Um, so let me go back to that. Um, I think I did have the slide somewhere, sorry. So we did ask individuals about... Um, Indica we had indicator variables on uh, conditions of life. Uh, life is close to my ideal, and so on. Uh, you can you can see that right now, right? It's the second uh, yes. latent variable, mm -hmm. subject to well-being, and uh, okay. those indicators really shaped how we define subject to well-being. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. I wasn't. I couldn't remember as part of a, a by standard scale or not. So, um, one of my students did a few different uh, well-being skills in a study, but I can't remember which um, which one those are. Okay. Um, uh, and then my second question. Go later ahead. on, if you send me an email, I can share the survey with you, so um, you can take a look into that. Okay, that'd be nice. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, and the second question was, um, or I guess a general question. Um, so we're uh, like we're um, looking at like the impacts uh, that COVID had, um, but I was wondering if um, you know, like the applicability of our work mm -hmm. for this, or, uh, or just not just this one, but in the others. Um, but we're not okay. We're also not biologists. We're not epidemiologists. So, is there some other type of pandemic that could occur that would be disruptive in which what we're what we have studied like wouldn't be valid? Like, you know, would the um, these ideas of uh, like you know, like here be, be, be being in a compact, walkable, accessible, build environment decrease your perception that, that like you know being around others or like doing like doing sustainable modes were, uh, were risky is there a, a, a situation where that would not hold like you know it would that it would that uh, the people that live really close together wouldn't actually probably would be would feel more concerned or the people that were in these better 
travel, more sustainable travel advisors would feel more concerned? So I, I think that's an interesting question. And I, I, to be perfectly honest, I do not know. As you said, like we're not in the medical field, so I don't know what type of other, um, you know, um, pandemics we may face into the future. But if you look at the history, like when pandemics generally changed how we live, right? So when we had in um, 1800s, 1900s, when we had these pandemics like cholera or flu and so on, some of them really uh, forced people or made people move to suburbs because they felt like, you know, having a backyard, not being able to, being able to uh, stay at a distance from others could really affect, could really uh, make their lives better. So that were those were some of the effects of flu. And then cholera really shaped how we do um, our infrastructure. So I think every pandemic really brings about a change in our lives. And looking into the future, of course, we cannot really predict what the next pandemic is going to be. But we talk about, you know, urbanized areas, more people living in more urban areas and the population is increasing. So we're actually making more of a footprint on the planet. Right. So with that, we're actually increasing our interactions with some of the other species, plants, animals and so on. So with that, actually, some people predict that we're going to be more prone to pandemics into the future. But in terms of your question, what what implications these pandemics may bring, whether, you know, we, we may have a pandemic where the reverse will be good, like we want to stay close together instead of social distancing. That that's I don't know. But in terms of disruptions to the system, uh, pandemics are not the only disruptions to the system. Right. So we can think about extreme weather events. We can think about terrorist attacks. We can think about other uh, natural hazards where the transportation system could be affected. And with that, having walkable, bikeable, accessible environments would again help us, right? Thanks. Sorry about the coughing. <laughs> I think in my room is just a too cold. Um, so, uh, Gaucha, I follow up what um, you know what what Mike kind of asked. I was wondering, so people talk about new new norm after pandemic, right? And I think it's great that in your survey, actually you ask some questions and also you did the survey at different times and it probably gave us some insights. So you kind of have given like more details about the first batch of data. And one specific is like, um, how much you're going to change your travel mm -hmm. behavior. So I was wondering for the last survey that you had, when you compare those two, how significant um, the, the results are. So the numbers are not on top of my mind right now, uh, but there's a significant decline, uh, significant decrease in, in terms of people's um, willingness to reduce their travel. So I think uh, some people will reduce their travel um, for sure moving into the future, but the numbers, I think the estimate, the um, interest in reducing travel um, out, out of home activity participation and travel has declined as we moved through the pandemic. And I think part of it is we became more knowledgeable about the pandemic, right? When the first stay home orders were were there, we didn't know much about it. Uh, nobody was vaccinated. So it was really a black box. So people were really concerned. But then as we move along, we got more knowledgeable, we got, got vaccinated. And the other thing is we really didn't want to get stuck at home anymore because we're social beings, right? So we want to be around people. So um, I think a combination of all these changed people's uh, behavior or what they want into the future. Um, I, I don't know about um, you, but I think what I'm experiencing at Georgia Tech here is um, not everyone is coming to campus every day anymore. It's uh, basically people are doing these three days at work, uh, two days from home sort of um, arrangements for themselves. And I'm seeing this more and more in other industries as well. Um, so not just with, with faculty members, it's with staff members as well. And as a matter of fact, that will be one of the first questions we would get when we're hiring staff members, whether we would be able to give them the flexibility to work from home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that also 
have been kind of um, stated in some other studies, like uh, we probably do not see significant reduction of the trouble, but probably the, the different types of trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Trips and actually on the good side is maybe it help us to e more evenly distribute the trips during the day instead of have more significant in the morning peak and evening peak, which is good thing, could be a good thing, but it needs to be validated later, maybe in another two years, we can collect the real data and try to understand if that's true or not. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's key to continue collecting the data to really understand the behavior change and the directions. Um, so you, I think you're right in terms of the distribution of trips over the day, because quite a few people are also, you know, coming really early, leaving early. And I'm also experiencing more traffic on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays because I feel more people are taking Friday as a stay home day and Monday as a stay home day, therefore making the weekend a long uh, weekend. I mean, they're still working, so it's not like a long vacation weekend. But they try to do this Friday and Monday at home, and then um, everybody is working at work on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So um, it's just my observation. I didn't collect any data on that, but that's um, that's what we are observing. I don't know if you observe similar trends at Florida. Yeah, I, I think we saw that similar trend, and maybe I don't know how many years later, maybe we only work for four days, all of us, and then take a break for three days, who knows? Well, I'm not sure if that's going to happen in the US, maybe in <laughs> Europe, but <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. All right, so any other questions? Any other questions from audience, maybe students? So these transportation seminars, you have them on every, every friday every friday except the holidays and okay. every year during the semester but not summer we thought about you know to also have the summer session um but i guess in the summer most of people want to have more flexible strategy uh, schedule so mm -hmm. we we were looking into that but but we still you know um at the utc level we have also another series of webinar and then we invite, um, you know, we have in total like 54 faculty members involved in NISA. So, and I work on many different projects. And then they will give the PIs, co PIs will give presentations regarding the outcomes of the project. So, we have quite this. Oh, we also have podcasts actually, mm -hmm. um, that is more for, you know, uh, professionals as well as the general public. Uh, so we convey the information because we focus on, for NASA, focusing on the congestion reduction. So we want to showcase more like um, innovative and effective congestion reduction strategies to the mm -hmm. professionals and general public. Yeah, we have quite a, this kind of, you know, technology transfer and outreach efforts on our campus. Yeah. OK. Excuse me. Well, uh, oh, Shiwa. Hi, yeah. how are you? How are you? Uh, so we have a, uh, a doubt and question, so I'm handing over the mic to him. Okay. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So you said there was, uh, you said there was summer sessions, you know, on weekdays. Uh, uh, I'm interested. Yeah, I like to learn as much as I can about transportation, you know. Uh, is <laughs> I think that's a question for you. You you right? So <laughs> was that a question or it's a it's a it's a comment? Do you have any? It's a question, question? Uh, basically. Yeah, you said you have summer sessions, so I'm interested. Yeah. Oh oh, As I mean in. In the past summer, actually, Christina was thinking of organizing something, but um, yeah, so it's really dependent on how many students are interested in that and also, you know, dependent on the schedules or potential guests that we would invite. Um, we thought about that, but we was not successfully to do that in the past summer. Okay, and, it must be, yeah. Yeah, but in the coming summer, for your information, is we're going to have a new course, new summer course, 
which I call the Future Translation Talent to Cultivation course. And that is like a field trip based course by collaborating with City of Tampa, the Hillsborough County uh, MPO, and also the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority there. So, um, you know, just to keep an eye on the on the uh, promotion doc, uh, material that we send to all the students. So, so basically, we encourage you know, undergraduate students, graduate students to consider taking that in the summer. And when I mentioned the field trip based, is like we will order the shuttle from our transportation and parking service office, and the students will gather somewhere on campus, and then we'll go together to one of the offices of those agencies. And then the transition professionals and also the leaders and elected officials from those offices actually will give the lecture and it will be a very interactive <laughs> kind of format to answer the questions. And sometimes we also could, you know, uh, visit, for example, uh, the complete street projects in the city and right. we could experience like a street car. We can take the e-scooters, e-bikes and go along the, the river walk. And so it would be a very interesting and also informative and also how to say uh, diversified course in the coming summer. That's something I'm very sure because we already worked on the pilot uh, program in this semester. And so we definitely will launch that in the summer 2023. Okay. Wow, lots of fantastic plans. <laughs> Those are difficult to manage, so congrats. <laughs> it is, it is. Thank you. Shiva, do we have any other questions from the classroom? That's all that present. All right, great. Yeah, um, I want to thank Professor Aka again, you know, for delivering this presentation and it's it's very informative and I also really like um, how you design the slides. And sometimes while describing the econometrics modeling is not so fun, but you <laughs> made it so easy for us to follow. Yeah, yeah, thank you so yeah. Much. Uh, yeah. I try to do that, not including too much information, but just enough that, you know, um, we can understand the gist of it, right? Yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. All right. So as I mentioned, this is the last seminar in our uh, fourth semester. And next week actually is our final exam week at ESF. So I want to wish every student, if you are taking any courses, you have any final exams, wish you success um, for those final exams. OK. And um, I will see everybody in spring 2023, if not sooner. Well, thanks for inviting me. It was great to be with you virtually, and um, I look forward to meeting with you in person sometime. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone.